Hallelujah. Because I will good things for you. I desire good things for you. Yes, Lord. Arise, shine. into your hearts. Behold, I answer your prayers. I give unto you your heart's desire. But you must reach out for it. You must accept the responsibility, saith the Lord. You must listen to my voice. Hear what I have for you. Hear what it is you need to do as a body, as my church, as my people. Behold, I am the Lord, and I will guide you if you will listen, saith the Lord. And all of the public officials smiling and celebrating that now in the state of New York, up to the very last possible moment, a baby can be aborted. So that it's illegal to give lethal injection to a criminal in New York. But it is perfectly legal to take the life of a baby that is moments away from birth. And now, with the incredible technology we have, with sonograms, with four-dimensional technology in which now... Not only do we guess, but we can see beautiful images of the child in the womb. I agree with Mother Teresa. She says, a nation that kills its unborn has lost its soul. I have a message on my heart, but uh, for just a moment, I want you to weep with me for our nation. And weep for the ones who have not been given their voice. God, we, we cry out to you for our nation. We, we weep over this, God. Oh, Lord, your heart must break. Father, as atrocious as the things were of World War II and six million Jews slaughtered and five million of other nationalities and other identities slaughtered, 11 million died. What a horrible, horrible tragedy that was. But here in our nation, we're lighting the World Trade Center peak to celebrate. Oh God. Father, I pray for the people of New York today. I, I pray for people like Pastor Jim Simbel. I, I pray for a mighty anointing upon Brook Tab Choir. I pray, God, that the church in New York would rise up with healing in its wings. I ask, God, that you would shake our nation and change us. Change this law. And do not let it spread across the land any further. Our hearts weep, God, in humility. We call out to you and we pray that you would be merciful. Oh God, be merciful. And with all sincerity, I truly pray for the ones who grieve over decisions made in the past. I pray that the mercy and the grace of your healing power would just permeate and flow over them today. Ones that are sitting in this room and 
ones that are watching on Facebook Live, Lord, let healing flow right now. The healing power, the healing balm of Gilead, the healing of our Christ Jesus. Take away the pain, take away the wounds. Give reassurance, give comfort and healing in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All God's children say a big amen. Amen. Oh, that was a big one. I like it. Um, I want to um, I want to just mention as we turn our attention to God's word that um, next Sunday is going to be a really special day. Um, it is a day that um, we're we're calling Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> we're not calling it that. Millions of people around the world are calling it that, and uh, we're we're going to have. Fun here. Did you know it's fun to be a Christian? Yes. How many yeah. of you enjoy being a Christian? I mean, yeah. I, just, I, just, I just love the way it rolls off the tongue. I like the sound of that word. It has to do with bubbling up of expectation and hopefulness. Uh, it's not a word that you hear often. It's a word that has to do with just coming alive. Coming alive. And uh, it's the idea of teeming with life. And today's talk is titled Truth is stranger than fiction. Truth is stranger than fiction. We'll be using the word stranger in a way that, that you might not anticipate. Um, Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, this is the overarching theme, and it has been for this month. And it reads like this, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Keep thinking about things above. Amen. <laughs> Not things on the earth. Yes. That's good advice. Yes. Now just for a moment, I want to review with you what we've talked about this month so far. Um, the first week was about the wardrobe. The Christian gets a new wardrobe. Clothed in Christ. Some things in the wardrobe get thrown out. Uh, Paul says, put off such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his practices. Some things need to be worn regularly. Clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. And then some things need to be taken to goodwill. Forgive one another. Add to these virtues love, the perfect bond. You know, that was week one. Week two, hey, reciproco. How you doing, reciproco? Don't be conformed, but rather be transformed, and then you will be informed. Sin sizes up, but grace is accelerated, and it's exponential, and love reveals. Now, last week, we didn't have preaching, and that was just okay with me. <laughs> if we would have had preaching, you would have heard things like this about this vescent life, that um, we belong to one another, that we are being renewed, and um, that um, the vescent life, it, when you're really in tune with God, the fish start multiplying like rabbits. <laughs> And it happens as long as your nets are clean. And so we got to have clean nets that are that that represents systems that are tied in good strong knots that hold the fish that come in. And then we have to call other boats and say, "Hey, we got too many fish." Come on, right? Up. Okay. So that was there. You had last week's sermon in about forty-five seconds. <laughs> but each week I've given you this picture of what the vessel life really is. Uh, first week I said it's like rain that gets soaked down into the ground and, and then it, it uh, evaporates and, and it changes the atmosphere and then it rains again and that's kind of how God does with you. And then uh, second week I said, you know, it's like seed in the soil. It's, uh, it stirs up the confusing chaos of the darkness. It reaches for the sun that it can't even see, but it senses there's warmth up there. And it reaches for it and it grows and it becomes something that it wasn't, a new life. And it gives wonderful fruit, nuts, vegetables until the end of its life. And then it, it painstakingly, it has destroyed the seed 
is planted again, but it springs forth into new life. That's vessence. It's you never really got. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. So you should be a fruitful life for the king. And then when it times when it comes time for you to step on the other side, then your life will be reproduced in others around you. Now this morning, here's the picture. Along those lines, I want you to consider life itself, the way life works. Birth, activity, death. But life springs forth eternal. We never really die. We live eternally into infinity. And in Christ, we get to experience immortality. Stop for a moment and think about your reciprocating life. Just think about it. How much of your existence is transitory, transitional, passing away? You are passing away until you pass away. Your flesh, your outer shell, which you thought was so permanent when you were a young person, is not as muscular, not as enduring, not as relentless as you once thought. Slowly it happens without you realizing it. How quickly one moves through the paces of life, just like a quarterback checking off all the options that he has. Infancy, childhood, adolescent, teenage years, 20-something, young adult. What? 30? Me? No. How did that happen? What? Spouse? couple of kids, man, a job, a dog, a cat, 40 and fit, fortified physique, fortune, middle age, me, no, 50, 60, 70, ache, hurt, pain. The Bible says we're given 70 years or 80 if we're especially strong. Some of us are even stronger than we know. 90 and beyond. Norman Lloyd is 104 years old. He's an actor. He's not planning on retiring anytime soon. <laughs> this life eventually passes away. But until you pass away, you are passing away. Our life consists of temporary things that pass right through us. Finances slips through your fingers. Uh, it, can, it can distract you if you try to hold on to it too quickly. Proverbs says you'll say, wait, where'd you go? Um, intelligence? I had a good thought. What happened to it? Have you experienced that? Um, in one sense, and without trying to be good, too graphic, food is a perfect example of the way things work. It passes away. Uh, Mr. Monk was a compulsive person who really needed cleanliness, and he could not have a pet dog because, as he said, pets, they eat, but then they uneat. <laughs> You know, that, that's the way it is in, in your life. You, you, uh, you, you have things passing through continually. And basically, your life consists of what kind of a screen are you? How do you do at screening the stuff life throws at you? Uh, you can't take titles with you to heaven. You can't take degrees. You can't take the corner office. You can't take the wealth. You can't take a six-digit salary. Uh, the only thing you can take to heaven with you is people. You can take people with you to heaven. But you can't take any of the other stuff. You can take relationships. Amen. The vessel's life. Something new. Something life-giving. Something sustainable. It's, it's a God idea. It cycles. It reciprocates. I, I want to close out this teaching this morning with John's words, chapter 10. He quotes Jesus' teaching about what a true shepherd is like. Let's read 18 verses that could change your life. Lock in John chapter 10, starting at verse number 1. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. 
The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. Say stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Say stranger. stranger. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Verse 7, therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. There you have the devil's job description. That's all he's about. Steal, kill, destroy. And his fingerprints are all over our society. But thank God, verse 10 does not end there. It says, I, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So he continues, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and he does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. That's important. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, Jesus says. And then listen to this. I have authority to lay it down, and authority to take it up again. This command, this ordinance, I received from my Father. I want to share with you three different observations this morning, and I'm, I'm borrowing these phrases, or not the exact words, but the, the intent, the, um, the, the word picture. I'm borrowing from a theologian, his name is Michael Horton, and, and he says, actually, when we meet God, it's like meeting a stranger. And so three observations. Number one, God is a stranger in a real way. Now, Michael Horton is not saying, God is really strange. That's not what he's saying at all. But he's talking about real, think of it like reality. Um, real in the sense of almost like real estate. Real estate is an estate that has real substance. It's something you can get your hands upon. And so when, when we think about God, His reality, well, he, in one sense, He's a stranger to us because His reality is entirely different than our own reality. And here's what that's really about. There's this fancy word, it's called ontology. And it means, it has to do with how do you perceive things that are real. And some of you may have even studied that word in philosophy classes, if you ever took a college philosophy class. Um, in a real way, how do we relate to God? How, how do we relate to Him? And, and how does He relate to us? People have tried to define it in different ways, but basically... There's this sort of overarching view of how we really interact with God, and it falls down into two ways. One, transcendent. He is transcendent. Two, eminent. He is eminent. Those are big 
nine dollar words. Let me just unpack them for a moment. Transcendence. It means that God is so far beyond anything we could ever hope or imagine that we can't even conceive of who He really is. Because He's God and we're not. That, that, that statement that says, there is a God and you're not Him, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, even if you were the very best human you could be, you're still human. So there's this demarcation, a line where only humans go this far, but then God, and how do we even begin to understand Him? It's like uh, one person said one time, the only problem with the rat race, even if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> So God is, is transcendent. He's, he's beyond anything we can think or imagine. Now, some people tried to wrestle with that, and they, we call them deists. They were the ones who believe that God is so much bigger and far beyond anything we can imagine that, that He's sort of like just spinning the earth around like it's an alarm clock and wound it up and just sort of let it run itself to see what happens. But He's detached from us. He doesn't see us. He doesn't interact with us. And... They were partly right because God is beyond and above and in control. But they, fit, they were way short of how powerful He is. I mean, we can't even begin to think of the tips and outer uh, edges of our universe and how God is continually creating. And he, He's so God that we can't even get on His level. So we're way too short when we try to describe Him. That's transcendence. But then there's this other word, eminence. Eminence is... When God invades humanity, He reaches out to us. He intercepts our affairs. He's involved with humanity. And He proved it by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. So, um, some people who try to explain that, they see God in everything. And they say, well, you know, God is nature. And there's, a, there's two words, pantheism, panentheism. And it, it means, well, sometimes on certain contexts, well, that rock right there, see, that's God. That sunset, that's God. And that tree, that's God. Because God is on it. It comes way short of describing Him. It, that's not God. God comes into and intercepts all that we're about. So in this one sense, He's way, way, way out there. But then Paul says, If you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth, that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you're saved. Amen. So, this transcendent God has chosen to invade us. It is imminent. Amen. But there's a sense, and it's a very real way. God is a stranger to us. But we spend our lifetimes getting to know Him. I, I love getting to know Him. The more I know Him, the more I think, I don't even know you yet. <laughs> That's good. Second observation, God is a stranger in the right way. Yes. Well, what I mean by that, so... There were these three words that people who thought about things like this tried to really pull together to define what's happening in our universe. Maybe you've heard of them. Logos, pathos, ethos. Logos, the voice. Uh, the word logos, it means word. And it means reason. And in this very text, we have some of that that voice, that reason, that word. The Bible says that Jesus is the living word. He, he is the living Logos. His sheep follow Him because they know His what? His voice. He's speaking. Uh, verse 17 we read, The reason my Father loves me. This is the living Logos. This is our God. And then pathos, you can almost hear the word empathy or sympathy. What is pathos? It's when you feel it deeply. And we have uh, pathos demonstrated by our Lord right here. He, he has deep feelings for his sheep. He says, a hired hand, that guy's just going to run at the first sign of danger, but not me. I love my sheep. I have feelings for my sheep. I lay down my life for my sheep. Do you know the actual picture of what he's talking about? He says, I am the gate. 
a tradition among the shepherds of Israel. They would go into the mountains and they would find while they're feeding on the lush green pastures during the daytime that they knew there was extreme danger in the middle of the night. And so they would find a hewn out cave, just the right one. And they would usher all the sheep into the cave. And then the shepherd, because he loves his sheep and cares for his sheep, while the sheep are asleep in the cave at nighttime, he lays across the mouth of the cave to protect his sheep in the night. That's how much feeling he has for you. That's how much love he has for you. But he's a stranger in the right way. That's ethos. That's ethics. That's where we get the word ethics. It's ethical. What does that mean? It means do the right thing, whether anybody's looking or not. There's a right and there's wrong, and always do the right thing. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Twice he says that. I'm the good shepherd. So he's, he's God who is a stranger to us in a real way, and he's a stranger in the right way, but the third way, God is a stranger in a redemptive way. Truth is stranger than fiction. This stranger that we can't quite get handles on, we can't quite figure out everything there is to know about him. This stranger invites us into fellowship with him. He says, I want to sit down and have table fellowship with you. He says, I love you. You are my sheep. You know my boys. It's imaged by the shepherds of Israel when they would go to water the sheep. You can see this even in the ancient times before they were in Asia. Jacob comes upon the well and, and the sheep are out there and there's there's shepherds and he says, why, why haven't you guys moved the stone out of the way of the well? Well, we can't do it until everybody gets here. But, but he sees Rachel coming and he's, he, I guess he felt adrenaline running. I don't know. But he's just, whoa, he moved that stone and got it out of the way so that the sheep could, could uh, water. But it's an amazing thing. When the sheep water, they, they can, you can blend entire flocks and they'll just drink and drink in the water that's pulled up. But all they have to do, the shepherd begins to walk. He gives a command or a whistle. His sheep know. This shepherd goes that way. This shepherd goes that way. The sheep follow their shepherd because they know the voice Amen. of their shepherd. And so quiet all of the strange voices that are out there in our world today. Hear the voice of our good Savior. Our strange shepherd who is real, way more real than we can ever imagine, who is right but who redeems us. It's a beautiful surprise. The surprising, wonderful announcement that instead of, in spite of human rebellion, He will redeem us Amen. with His grace Amen. alone. That verse that I, I just hope it stood out to you so much, it really sums up what this teaching series is about. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. <clears throat> he wants you to have the best of life. He wants your life to be brimming over. I felt it this morning as we were worshiping. And I was just thinking of, as we were singing and worshiping. And, and Lord, just all the things that you might be doing around the room. All of the, the weights that we carry and just falling off. And, and us brimming up with new life and new hope. And sometimes you can go out in that world and it's a mean up place and it just beats you up and you come into God's house and you might be weary. You haven't done anything wrong. You're faithful. You're serving God, but you're just tired. And you come into His presence and then the worship team starts to sing and the songs start rising up and, and from within the midst of the assembly come the encouragements that, and, and something inside you, it fortifies you like steel and you, you think to yourself, I can steal. I can do it again. I can go out another week. I can make it. The vessels life. Um, I always told Zach and Nick, there's room for both boys in daddy's lap. Until there wasn't. <laughs> I, I used to love to get down in the floor with the boys. and We had this game called Daddy Mountain. And I, they, oh daddy, can we play Daddy Mountain? Can we play Daddy Mountain? Man, when they're a little tiny, I'd take them by the hands, and they just kind of dangle their feet, and I'd say, "Climb up Daddy Mountain," 
and sit up on the top. When you fall down, you will make a plop. And you I love to play Daddy Mountain until it got to the point where the mountain was kind of getting broken up. You know what I'm saying? Man, you guys are way too big. Can't play Daddy Mountain anymore. But I wish I could. Oh, I wish I could. If I tried it now, they would give me a hernia. I know. <laughs> but you know what God is like? God is like a parent who plays peekaboo with his little boy. He hides. Peekaboo. Oh, even a little baby, an infant. Oh, they just laugh and they just love it. The father is letting the child find him. That the child has the sense that, oh, I found him. The father knows I'm really letting you find me. But as it goes along, there's something really wrong with a teenager who can't find the father. And as you grow up, there comes that point where you, the father releases that child who has grown. And sometimes there's turbulence during those years. But it's, it's very, very important that the child choose the love that the Father is giving. Amen. And that's the vescent life. Each week I'm closing with a vapor pressure <laughs> that changes atmosphere. And this is the one this morning. He is brimming over with life, life to the full. Life the way it was meant to be lived. He offers you that. Why would you accept anything less than that? It involves now as an adult coming back to our Father and say, saying, I, I recognize that you are God. I recognize that you're my source of hope. This morning when um, I was printing out the um, worship guides and um, the, the little you know, one sheet worship guide that we give you. And and um, one of them, I was trying to put it in the back of the printer and it fell out and went behind the, um, the desk, it, up against the wall, right down back there. And I'd already printed the one side of it. I, I need that. I, got, I need that one. I don't want to have to print another one. I, you know, I guess I could, but I, in my mind, it was easier to slide the desk out. And I found the graveyard of worship guides. <laughs> I'm like, I never knew that was back there. Three years ago, whoa, I forgot even preaching that. Look at this one, that one's six months old. I didn't know that was back there. And I began to think about, I wonder how, oh, I wonder how we're doing over the trajectory of our Christian life. Are we really growing? Are we becoming someone that we were not? I, I hope. Are we being stretched? Um, I really, I enjoy teaching in series because as a pastor, it helps me to bring my focus to, to a specific area. Uh, it, in the middle of February, I'm going to be starting a brand new series that was inspired by Pastor Darren and Pastor Adam. And they didn't do it on purpose, but it's called Planet Witness not Planet Fitness, Planet Witness. And uh, it's, it's a global strategy for reaching the world with end time evangelization. But I, I love, I love to, to teach that way and bring my focus to an area. And, and then later this year, you can really expect that you're gonna be living with me because I'm living the book of Romans this year. We're gonna be, we're gonna be having some Romans conversations. I love the book of Romans. But I started thinking this morning, I hope that we're not the same way that we were when we first came here, Stephanie and I, 14 years ago. It was September 2005. Hopefully, we're growing. How horrible it would be for a person to get saved and then um, remain that infant on daddy's lap and just love to giggle and goo and gah and just stay there and not grow. 
And babies are just precious, and we love babies, and we want more and more of them, amen? And we're, man, our nursery team, they're getting excited about having more babies back here. But here's the thing. There's something really wrong with an eight-year-old wearing diapers. Are you with me? God wants us to grow. And so over your walk with God, have you, I, I've been saved 40 years, have you been growing every year? Or is it, is it the case that you repeat a cycle each year and you go back to the beginning and you're still a year old? That, oh, that's hard preaching, Pastor Keith. Don't say that to me. Take it up with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Amen. Hopefully we're being stretched and growing. And I, I sense through the word that the Lord shared with us this morning that that's His heart. That He, he wants us to be challenged, to be stretched, to be grow, to to be grown, to be a healthy organization, clicking on all eight cylinders, with with systems in place, prepared for as people are coming in to disciple them and release them back into our community to see community transformation. Amen. And so, um, I want you to experience the best of life. Here's how uh, I started my day. This is my Bialetti. Um, this is a gift that my wife gave me, and it is, um, when we went to Italy to visit Nick and Taylor, uh, we, we had just an amazing time with them, and we did, um, if you, got, if you haven't met them, Nick is our son, and Taylor our beautiful daughter-in-law, and every place that we went, they, they picked out uh, four different locations. We went on a little trip, and, and one place we spent four days there, then another place three days, and then some of them were just overnight. Uh, but we went through a lot of the different towns of Italy, and we stayed, um, we stayed in four different Airbnbs. And it was awesome. And what I found out about the people in Italy, they're way different than the people in America. Like in America, it's, hey, don't bother me. The key is there. Here's your code. Please, emphasis, don't bother me. That's how Airbnbs work. And I, I like that, actually. I think that's pretty cool. But in Italy, man, they, they show up and they're like, here, let me show you. Here's the first bedroom. Is it to your liking? Here, here's the bedroom, the second bedroom. Here's... Um, this is an office you can use. One of them was so amazing. Uh, he says, hey, my dad and me, we run this place. And dad, he just got some bread from the bakery. And it's on the, it's on the kitchen table. Please help yourself. <laughs> if you get cold, here's the thermostat. Change it and set it however you like. There's spaghetti in the cabinet. If you want to make spaghetti, make it a spaghetti. And like, we probably won't make spaghetti. We wouldn't know how to do it the way you do it. But it was awesome. And I'll tell you, each one of the four Airbnbs we were at had a Bialetti. And I didn't even know how to work it at first. And man, it's a wonderful way to have coffee. And Stephanie surprised me for Christmas and she got me an authentic Bialetti. And uh, you put the water in the bottom, and then it, it's sort of a single cup deal where you can, you can, um, you can percolate, sort of the old-style percolator where the water comes up through the grounds, and, and it is so rich and aromatic, and it's just a robust 9.2 ounces of glory. As you, I mean, it is, it is awesome. And, uh, and here's how the Italians, they love to do this. Um, they, they have bread. And you take the bread, and I don't know why, but they are fascinated with Nutella. Every place had Nutella. And man, you spread the Nutella on the crispy toasted bread, and it's so delicious, and it's so bad for you. But it was so good. And I, I kind of got in the habit of doing that when I came back. And then I was like, oh, i got to stop, stop doing this so much. But I don't know if you can see it. Can you make out the vessels? Do you see the steam coming out of the top? When it percolates, when the coffee is ready, you can, you can just, you can hear it bubbling, you can see the steam coming out, and, and you say, man, it's ready, it's ready. That's a picture to me of the best of life. That's what God wants for each one of us. I asked Pastor Mo if he would just come back and, and uh, the team lead us, and just however he, he feels led, and, and just a response to the word and then also um, after he has just led us and, and it feels like it's the appropriate timing uh, he's going to have Pastor Dale come and dismiss in a word of prayer for us 
I encourage you to in, uh, uh, um, engage, uh, react to what God is saying to you this morning, whatever that might be. And let's leave out of this place changed and truly different people. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You are here doing elements and worship and worship. You are here doing elements and worship. Light in the 
In Jesus' name, bless you. 